welcome to all of you. Um, I am incredibly excited um, for this uh, conversation. Um, so uh, welcome to the roundtable discussion of No Ordinary Man. I'm Dana Seitler and I'm the director of the Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at the University of Toronto. The Bonham Center is located on the territory of the Huron, Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This means that we are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honoring and, and upholding these agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this territory and to share space with all of you today. Um, so this all began several months ago. I think actually it was over the summer where I started hatching a plan with Chase to bring the ordinary man to the center. Um, and I'm so thrilled that it has come to fruition. I hope you have all enjoyed watching the film as much as I did. Uh, and now we have the honor of talking with some of the folks that have made it happen. So um, I'm going to briefly introduce everybody uh, on the round table. Uh, joining us today are Ashling Chin Yi, uh, who is a Canadian film director, writer, and producer. Her films include The Rest of Us, Synesthesia, and No Ordinary Man, which was awarded the Best Canadian Feature at the Inside Out Film and Video Festival. Chase Joint, a co the, the co-director of No Ordinary Man, is a writer, director, and assistant professor of gender studies at the University of Victoria, whose films have won jury and audience awards internationally. His last short film, Framing Agnes, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and is being developed into a feature film with support from Telefilm's, Telefilm Canada's Talent to Watch program. And we're gonna bring that here too, I'm so excited. Or well, if Chase lets us. Uh, most recently, Chase directed an episode of Two Sentence Horror Stories for the CW that arrives on Netflix in February, 2021. Amos Mack is a writer, producer, and visual artist currently writing on the new Gossip Girl series for HBO Max. As a producer, he's worked across documentary and unscripted forms, including Gaycation for Viceland. He is a founding editor of Original Plumbing, the print zine that artfully do documented trans male culture from 2009 to 2019. Um, Amos Mack is both in the film and co-wrote No Ordinary Man with Chin Yi. Um, and then next we have Marquise Vilson, uh, who is an actor and activist. He made his New York stage de debut off-Broadway as Berta in MCC Theater's Charm, and his feature film debut as Leon uh, in Peter Hedge's Ben is Back. As a young trans man, Marquise was featured in the doc documentary The Aggressives from 2005, and is a longstanding member and participant of the underground ballroom scene in New York City. Upcoming projects include The Kitchen, starring Melissa McCarthy and Tiffany Haddish, NBC's The Blacklist, and the Netflix's, Netflix's Tales of the City. My co-host today is Allison Burgess, who is the director of the Sexual and Gender Diversity Office at the University of, the, of Toronto, and the SGDO is graciously co-sponsoring this event with us, and so we thank them uh, for that. Um, so the format for today is as co-hosts, Allison and I are going to ask some questions um, to the, the, the roundtable participants, but we also really, and maybe most of all, welcome questions from all of you. Um, so we will ask that you uh, write your questions in the Q&A. And um, when um, the time comes, we'll be reading the questions from there. The chat is open and available and you can have informal conversations over there, but please post your questions in the Q&A so we don't have trouble seeing them. Um, and also live ca captions are available um, to you. So um, to the panelists, just welcome. It's a thrill uh, to have you here virtually. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I just want to get us started um, by hearing a little bit from each of you. And so to that end, I wonder if you could share with us just a little bit about what it was like to, to write, direct, produce, and act in this film. Um, I'd love to hear about the overall process, all the feelings involved um, you know, during the, the filming, um, and, and really what it meant to you to be part of the project. 
and uh, anybody can volunteer to go first. <laughs> Ash, do you want to start us off? I knew you were going to do that. Um, that's a, those are a lot of those are a lot of questions wrapped up in one. Um, a lot of feelings. <laughs> I know. Answer them all. <laughs> okay, let's let's start at the beginning. Um, well, yeah, so, so my, my involvement in the project was I co-wrote and co-directed this film, but it was really made with this team, you know, with, with this collaboration of the three of us um, that we kind of feed off of each other's energies and also each other's skill set. And it really, it really came to fruition with the three of us and with Parabola Films and Sarah Spring who produced the movie. And so my involvement and my interest in it was really discovering um, Billy Tipton for the first time through the research of making this film uh, as a non-trans person. He wasn't someone who I had encountered before before making this film. And so in, you know, peeling back some of the layers and and doing the research and 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 you know meeting people in his life and and uh, and Amos and I went down to Stanford and dug through all these archives and got to touch his belongings and read his sheet music and, and all of these things was kind of the piecing together of this person who um, lived this amazing and vibrant life, was a very talented musician, was complex in all the ways that all of us are individually complex. And also, you know, like it was somebody who just, you know, lived a very successful life as a, as a talented, a talented guy in the decades that he, that he came up in. So it was, that was an entry point. And then of course, when you research him, you know, online, what you find out about him is so uh, distorted from who he actually represented himself to be. So it was taking a, you know, looking at a way that we could reframe that in a, in a, in a, in a more correct light, or at least the way that we saw him. So that's kind of, you know, that was the kind of the ethos and, and the motivation behind making the film. Um, I, at least, you know, I think from, from my part and I think from, you know, for a big part of us, uh, we kind of came to that conclusion collaboratively. And then making it was a, was, a, was a dream, it was a treat. It was the people that we had, you know, generously involved in the film were so fantastic and you get to see so many of them in, in this process. So like, it was, it was great. <laughs> it, was, it was all great. And, and all the ups and downs that go in between that. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember when um, I heard from Ash for the first time when she and Parabola were looking for a trans masculine writer to join and, and really dig into the weeds as to Billy's story through research and, and really like discuss deeply how to tell his story in a way that wasn't out there at the time. Um, so that was, I was very quick to say yes because you know, I had seen Billy Tipton, his story like online in the ether of trans, of, you know, trans culture for, you know, many years or like as maybe like since the early 2000s, I'll say like finding him on the, you know, on websites while researching trans men in history, but there was never a ton of information and it always focused on, you know, his, uh, what happened after he died. So in terms of like his story coming out and like the way that his story was presented, so the process of like going into the archives with Ashling and, you know, I remember holding his driver's license and, and reading letters that he had written to his, his, uh, his loves and finding his wedding album and things like that. It was, I mean, I feel like I could do that all day, that kind of thing, <laughs> like digging into like the research element was just a blast and figuring out how to tell his story was incredible. You know, um, I don't know if I'm, answering all of the questions, Dana, that you <laughs> set out at first, but that was my, you know, foray into the project. Yeah, right, great. I have follow-up for everybody, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's a beginning, thank you. Um, Chase or, or Marquise? Sure, I'm happy to follow up. You know, as a trans person interested in trans history, I'm always paying attention to, to who controls the narrative. And for so long, the details of Tipton's life have been controlled by the talk and tabloid media. And our project and the invitation to join the project was an opportunity to think what could happen with this story and with these interlocking histories if they were approached from a trans perspective. And, you know, the intertextual geekiness of this project really gets me going from being able to join a team with Amos who, you know, 
we'll start with hot gossip. You know, I identify as someone who I, in some ways, like grew up with or transitioned with, separate and apart, you know, so long ago now, and whose creation of original plumbing was such a hugely significant part of my own early self-understanding about what would be possible at the intersection of, of art and politics and joining Ash and Sarah from Parabola, just incredibly badass, politically incisive storytellers. And then, you know, the early phases of watching casting tapes come in and encountering Marquise's tape and literally jumping out of my seat with joy at the recognition of this person who I recognized from the aggressives, an incredibly formative doc about transmasculine history yes. that as was right. articulated in his bio came out in the early 2000s when we were not in a moment of hyper visibility of trans and non-binary people and thinking what could happen if we joined some of these conversations together. So what would it look like to be in dialogue with someone like Marquise about contemporary practices and historical representations of trans masculinity? Thank you. I just work here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they all answered, I think as perfectly as you possibly could be with regards to this film. For me coming in, I guess, as a subject and creative consultant, maybe, I, I guess, um, I was really excited because it was about Billy Tipton. And so being able to, to be a part of an opportunity that re-examines his story and tells it in a way that is full of empathy and allows you to fully see him, the way he had fully seen himself and represented himself, I think for me was just super cool to be a part of because historically we've just never seen that happen. Um, so yeah, I was, I was really just excited and enamored to be a part of the process. Shocked, of course, because obviously I'm black and Billy Tipton is, is not. So I was kind of like, what are they talking about? Like, why in the world would you want me to come and read and, you know, for a part of, of Billy Tipton? But I'm glad that I did. Um, to be able to really think about what it meant to be Billy Tipton in those moments in time per those sides was just, it was kind of mind blowing to be honest with you. So to this team, thank you again. And also to you all, thank you for having me, having us. Yeah, thank you for being here. I mean, if I could just add a quick follow-up question to that, just really for everybody. I mean, Amos was saying you didn't know about Billy Tipton until the project, is that the case? Because I'm just wondering like how, did how much uh, were you, did you encounter Billy Tipton for the first time? Marquise, for example, you know, in this project, um, were, were you aware of any of that history? I'm wondering. For me personally, yes. I, I discovered Billy Tipton as early as probably 2003 or 2004. So this was a year just before the aggressives came out. And it was a year or two anyway, just before that. And for me, it was also moment in time where I was about to start my medical transition and I was learning about all of these folks that had come before me. I think it was really important for me to learn about my ancestors and think about the possibilities of what a life, you know, a full life anyway could look like. Granted, um, Billy Tipton was not someone who was like publicly out or anything like that. However, it, it, I still feel like in the way of our own history, it's super important to like know who he is and know what he was and, and more importantly know what he's contributed to, to our society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, is that the same question to me? Sure. I mean, you were, oh, I, I you were unmuting, know. so I thought you wanted to answer it. <laughs> oh, no, I, I thought that you mentioned my name earlier. So, sorry. I did. I did. Okay. I thought yeah. you said you, I couldn't, I didn't remember if you had said you did or you didn't know about Billy. Er, I did in the early 2000s, same, same as Marquise, you know, um, researching trans history, wanting to find trans men in the world um, and in the history books and coming across a clunky website that listed a few names and Billy was one of them. Yeah, oh, okay, that's interesting, yeah. Um, I wanna now turn this over to my co-host, Allison, and I'm going to, I know some of you already have written um, your questions in the Q&A and I encourage everybody now participating in the audience to continue to do so. And we're going to kind of bounce back and forth and intersperse your questions with ours. Um, so, so please go ahead and add those to the Q&A. Thanks, it's so great to, to meet all of you in, in this space, uh, even, even in strange moments uh, doing these, op these are great opportunities to meet virtually. I wondered if you could talk to us, uh, whoever wants to take the question, to talk to us about the decisions that you, the kind of decision-making process or production process in terms of drawing on some of that footage from the Jerry Springer show. Um, 
I think about I think about the Jerry Springer show and I think about like my own learnings around around our identities and and for people who are coming of age in the 80s and 90s this was kind of the first way that people sometimes learned about trans people right but it's also such difficult content and I the first time I watched the film during Inside Out I just was like so I hadn't seen that footage in so long or like footage like it's you know Springer type material I was so I was so taken aback by it it, it had been a while uh, having wa watching it again I, t I kind of felt differently about it so I'm really curious to know kind of thinking about how you made decisions around engaging some of that content knowing how difficult it is but also I guess recognizing it's part of that history yeah absolutely and so much that's already embedded in that question are things that we were thinking about in the use or misuse of that footage in in the edit which is to say it's always doing a kind of double duty it's revealing a kind of violent spectatorial curiosity and also it's an avenue through which queer and trans people were finding each other through any means necessary and recognizing representations of themselves even if not perfect uh, served as portals or opportunities to imagine what a life could be otherwise or elsewhere. I think where the talk show footage picks up different momentum in our work is in thinking about the presence of Tipton's family on that circuit at that time. And so what does it mean for someone like Billy Jr. and Kitty Tipton to be in the same kind of environment as trans subjects and what are they doing? What scripts are they reading and or not in their presentation of self and their protection of their father and their husband at a time where there weren't very many examples of a kind of familial solidarity in that kind of media landscape. And you know, one of the things that's so fascinating to us in the pre-interviews with so many of our subjects is, is talk shows hold such a significant weight in many of our own personal becoming. And Marquise, I know to throw to you that you're someone too. We talk out loud about how some of the first representations of people who were potentially a little bit like us were on these, on these shows and in these formats. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's I looking back at it, you know, in terms of the film. So I, I anytime we do a talk with regards to No Ordinary Man, I watch the film. I rewatch. This is just me personally. And having an opportunity to look at it again, I think that relationship, that sort of connection between uh, Tipton's wife uh, and his son and the audience, for me, just it is so magical in so, in so many ways, because it is the first time, actually now that I think about it, that I ever saw a family, people that were close to the trans person who were on the show that were completely in defense of them. And not necessarily in a way like, oh, I need to defend them in order to protect myself, but really protective of him and the relationship that they had with Billy Tipton. And so I, I think that you're right, um, Allison, that there's, when you look at this specific footage, there is a very different thing that has happened in that moment versus what we have historically seen. Um, and so, yeah, and in fact, that's interesting too, that you, you mentioned that in the way that like, um, you know, historically we have kind of like always seen our stories playing out in this way per the eighties and the nineties. And I know for me and myself, you know, thinking about the first time that I saw a black trans guy, it was on Jerry Springer. It was, you know, right. And while, you know, I am not at all a fan of Jerry Springer or the talks of, you know, circuit in, in general, I do think it was a way for trans people to find themselves, to see images of themselves, to feel like they were not necessarily alone. As problematic as all of that was, there's still a piece of me that is very grateful for those images because those images give us voice and face to what we see today in the way of scripted television, as an example. Um, if it weren't for those images, if it weren't for those fudges and getting them wrong, so. Yeah, that's a, I think that's such a really good point. I mean, I um, I think I might be the old, oldest person here, but I, I shouldn't have led with that. But um, I, yeah, I remember watching this tabloid television when there wasn't, internet you know we didn't we didn't have smartphones you know these things we didn't have text but these things didn't exist and i didn't watch jerry springer a lot but i did watch a lot of jenny jones who was similar and a lot of ricky lake who was similar but more queer right you know and and so yeah you know and, and I, I would watch it with friends and we would you know we obviously would clock it for its transphobia and its homophobia but it um it 
you know, it was also a it was a place of representation in um in lieu of anything else that was out there. Yeah. Or or was only out there via underground, you know, means and circuits and you know that sort of thing. So I really appreciate that. Um I wanna the, the questions are building up in the audience. So I think I'm gonna go to one. Um, and this is from Acadia Ford. This is the question from Australia. So it says, hello to the filmmakers and congratulations on an incredibly moving film. Would you be able to speak about the recruitment strategies for the actors? Who, who did that? Was it Amos and Ashling or yeah? The recruitment strategies. I mean, we um, <laughs> we do recruit. How did, how did you? We have a, we had a last year, and we, you know, um, well, we 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 had a casting director uh, that worked, you know, very closely with us, and well, they, you know, Russell Boast, who was recommended uh, by Nick Adams through Glad, and who is somebody who had really, you know, done a lot of inclusive casting before and diverse casting before. So we had a great conversation. He was totally on board with the project. I don't know if he'd ever done a documentary before because it what we had, when we put out the casting call, it was made very clear that, you know, this was a project that was looking at the life of Billy Tipton, that was a documentary and to participate in this, we, you know, we were inviting people to come participate in this film um, as themselves, uh, you know, to kind of interpret Billy from their perspective and their experience. So we did, you know, a, a full North American casting call. And then we did, um, and then we did sessions, live sessions in Los Angeles and New York. And so we had received tapes, just, you know, classic way. So casting tapes, and we were going, we were going through them and saw such an amazing array of you know, different talent and different ages and everything of uh, transmasculine talent. And that's when, um, and that's when we, you know, we're in, we encountered Marquise's tape for the first time and where Chase was saying that he was bouncing all over the walls. And so that was fun. I wish I had the camera rolling on that moment, <laughs> but I was just trying to like catch him. Um, and then immediately we contacted Russell and we're like, uh, can we talk to Marquise? We're in New York right now. <laughs> and we, we tracked Marquise down and, uh, and <laughs> you know, just like fanned our way into his hearts, we hope. And we're like, could you please be part of this movie? Um, and, and yeah, so then, and so it was, and, you know, Amos and Chase talk about it too, er, because it, it was a really interesting process, what we did in Los Angeles and LA, where we had these like, we had two cameras, one in the waiting room, one in the in the audition room, which was going to be run more classically. And Amos and I were were there doing the different scenes with the actors, and but outside was um, kind of a, a, a live discussion. You know, just you know, as any you know, as casting rooms can be or any waiting room would be, but also to kind of like encourage everybody to 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 feel comfortable to, to talk about their experiences and their questions about Billy and all of the different things to come forward with that. So it was, it was a classic, but also a different way of, uh, of having people participate in the movie. And yeah. I think one of the things too is building a casting call that required folks to join the room as themselves and understood that there was no narrative feature to be produced meant that it invited a kind of non-competitive conversation about the stakes of being a transmasculine actor in the contemporary moment. And time and time again in those rooms, we would hear, I've never been in a room like this before. I've never been, you know, surrounded by other transmasculine people to be able to talk about the highs and lows of this process and this industry in these ways. And so I think we are so often inundated in a conversation about casting, about cis people performing trans roles and the complexities of these choices. But the question for us changed and it wasn't about casting for performance, but casting as a way to think about embodiment and a kind of trans historical inhabitation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no moving, what's the term? Moving video, moving, there's no moving film images. footage. <laughs> moving, there's no moving image footage of, yeah. no moving images, period, of Billy <laughs> Tipton. <laughs> there's tons of photographs, you know? We have a lot of, we have his audio, we have, a, we have his home, you know, tapes that he would make to send to his mother-in-law during the holidays, you know, as like a fun little, like in a cassette tape form. 
but there is nothing uh, to show our actors um, as to like what how Billy Tipton moved. So that was uh, so freeing, I think, and, and su such a cool way to embody the character that we were trying to honor, mm -hmm. the person. Yeah. Which I, I actually found to be extremely cool because it was the first time that I had gone in for an audition for something that wasn't about like, you have so much research to do on the person. Like there was, there was of course, research that I did going in. Unfortunately, reading Diane Middlebrooks <laughs> um, suits me. Of course, I, I did read it because there was tons of helpful information there. But I do think Amos is right. Like in terms of the visual, there was nothing aesthetically to really go off of. So it was what, what I was interpreting about Billy Tipton in that moment where he lived, you know, in the genre of music he was in, the CD nightclubs, like the entire thing, like it just had to come to me as a way of like figuring out exactly how I would navigate that space if I were quote unquote Billy Tipton. Yeah. This is great. Thank you. There's a lot of comments around, lots of questions around casting, but I think across the, across all your answers you've, you've addressed, I think most of the questions that are coming in around casting. Um, there's another question here that now my screen has just jumped, so give me one moment. Um, uh, this is a comment following up, Marquise, one of the comments you said. So uh, Kyle says, uh, thank you so much for a fantastic film in this event. Following up on Marquise's comment about Kitty and Billy Jr. defending Billy, uh, Kyle says, I'm curious to hear about how you or anyone who wants to respond squares this with Kitty's comments to Diane Middlebrook that she would have divorced Billy if she knew he was transgender. So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. I'll try. <laughs> um, I think it was a pretty honest answer. And I, what I got from Kitty's response about that, I don't know if it was necessarily about his transness more than it was about a piece of information that was about his life that she just didn't know. And I think no matter who we are, dealing with another human being and being in a relationship with that person and feeling like there's something that you're shut off from with regards to their personal life, their history, it, you know, if for Billy in this conversation, it was about his transness. For someone else, it could be about the fact that they're married to someone else, right? It could be um, that they lied about their credit score or where they went to college. I don't know. It could be a, any number of those things. I didn't necessarily marry them as being one and the same because if there were this sort of like uh, innate disdain that she had for transness and just phobia in that way, would there be a need to be defensive about her relationship? about the person that she loved and she cared about who is no longer here. And the world is suggesting that, you know, you'd be ashamed of this human being. That wasn't something that she was willing to um, show us or, or, or express because that just wasn't a place that she was in. But I, I, I acknowledge that conversation to be really honest in that, you know, here's a person that might have just simply felt deceived. And so without having, it, of course, deception is it's a large conversation. Charlie. We can unpack <laughs> a lot of things with this word that I just used. But I think maybe for Diane, that, or excuse me, for, um, for Kitty, maybe that might have been the thing that she was sensitive, just feeling like, well, I didn't have access to this information. But if I had known, maybe that wouldn't have been the approach that I would have taken. Um, but she could have very well ended up being friends with Billy. Who knows? Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if that really answered the question. I just didn't, I didn't interpret it that way as that, as though she were quote unquote transphobic more than there was, wait, there's this information that I didn't know. And I wasn't given the opportunity to make a choice for myself. Oh, I bet we all have answers to this question. Should we keep going? I mean, I, I think to add to what Marquise is saying, you know, to the both end of it all, you know, the structure of the documentary betrays a public-private split. So we get to, to encounter Kitty on a talk show stage performing one version of Solidarity, and we hear a recorded conversation intended for a very different audience for a very different purpose. And I think that both need to exist and inform our understanding 
not only of her, but of the complexity of a relationship that we are never actually going to have access to. And that we always need to understand it as continually mediated, not only through the technologies of our finding in the archive, but through our additional layering of meaning by giving it to you in that way, to presenting you with multiple versions of, of the telling of this story and in the interpretation of this life. And um, to go off of to go off of that too, and and I'll 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 botch quoting Riley Snorton in the film of just like you know there's 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 a very the very the very real thing that two things can be true at the same time and contradictory, and so I think that that's what we're seeing there too. And also, um, I mean, it's interesting because you know the there are so many tapes that obviously didn't make it into the into the film of kitty and diane talking to each other and on over the months and years that they got to know each other and i think also there were times that like diane was you know she was definitely like you know loading the questions up as well for kitty um and Kitty had all sorts, Kitty was a co very complex human being. And the thing is she did leave Philly, you know? So whether she, it was, that would necessarily been like the ultimate decision for leaving him or not. It's like, they, they, they did split up, but they stayed very close. So um, yeah, I think there's so much that's so interesting and so private about their particular relationship, like any relationship is that, uh, that we could go on and on and on about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have, I have another question here. If, if we, I mean, I don't, Amos, if you wanted to say something about that or we can move on. There's lots of questions building up. So I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Um, and this says it's not a question, but it actually is. And it was one of the questions that I had for you as well. So I'm just going to ask it uh, as an audience question, um, but, but as a question, because it says it's not a question, but I liked that casting Billy as multiple as actors rescued him from a certain kind of transphobic scrutiny. Having multiple actors decentered the whole I can always tell discourse. And for me, the, the question version of this is, yeah, can you talk about that dis dis decision? Um, about the, the many, the many billies, you know, and then the decision, right, to have, as you said, the camera um, in the, in the waiting room. Um, um, because there's sort of a sense that, um, well, I'm wondering what you thought. I mean, for me, the sense I got as a, as a viewer was that in telling Billy Tipton's story and with, with these, by way of the, these multiple actors, um, the, the idea that the, a door is being opened for the telling of so many different stories about trans masculinity that are uncontainable or irreducible to Billy's story, but that don't often get told. Um, so, uh, but I'm wondering about the thoughts that you had in having that be such a big part of, of the film. Thanks for that question. And so much that is already baked into that question is true of our thinking about what a kind of multiplicity or a doubling or a tripling of representation can afford us. Um, and I think, you know, in approaching a story about someone who lost control of his narrative, it is methodologically a moment where we also lose control of our film and where the approach to casting and the ongoing engagements within those rooms becomes a kind of new politics of recognition. So not only trans masculine people looking back and recognizing something in Tipton, but also moments of contemporary culture making where Alex Davis looks across the camera at Amos and says, I can't believe that you are this person for me or <laughs> Marquise being able to say, I feel that anxiety in my body. And that recognition might be about transness, but it's, a, it's about a lot of other things. And I think that through multiples, we also acknowledge time and time again, that the project of creating a coherent story about a life is a failed project from the beginning. And so what other questions open up when you let go of the fantasy that you could get it right, or you could do it in one particular way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Marquise, what did it feel like to be one of the many Billies in relationship to this question, right? Because I mean, you touched on this a little bit and Riley Snorton um, was obviously in the film and, um, and his book, Black on Both Sides, you know, um, discusses this about the particular kinds of erasures of um, uh, Black trans histories. Uh, so I I'm wondering what that, what, it did, what did it feel like to be one of the many Billies? 
it was a really cool experience. I, I was shocked naturally again, because clearly I am not white. So <laughs> I was like, oh, this is very interesting. But I do appreciate this creative team wanting to bring a black trans mass person into the space to have that conversation, to see how that's going to feel for them in that space and also how it was feeling for me in my body, the way that I was sitting with that. Um, and I, I also think it does add to black trans masculine history, naturally being on film. Um, I, and I, I believe that that is super important to continue to be a part of that conversation, to be a part of that dialogue, letting people know that in order for black trans mass folk to have access to history, we also need to have access to space. And so what this film did, what the casting process did in that way was create space. And again, Ashe, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you. But for me, it was amazing. It, it really was, it was amazing, especially in lieu of, you know, being about Billy Tipton, mm -hmm. an honor, quite an honor. One of the other ways that I think we can approach this question too, and here sort of thinking out loud with Riley and Riley's work is the research and development and ongoing exchanges we had about concurrent forms of black trans masculine life and representation. So what does it mean to have conversations about Little Asks Broadnecks, for example, or Jackie Kay's novel Trumpet about, it's a fictionalized, uh, story of a black trans masculine trumpet player, but is riffing alongside some of the data points of Tipton's life history. And, you know, I was recently in conversation with Michelle Pearson Clark, who I know is in residence at the Bonham Center right now, I think. And, uh, you know, Michelle said something incredibly compelling to me in conversation, which was, you know, and I apologize for the, the quoting, but, you know, there are many things I make in pursuit of making a picture. And I really feel such resonances about, you know, what are the kinds of conversations and ways that we can world build around a film that extend far beyond what ends up on screen. Mm -hmm. Just wanna give space in case anyone else wants to answer. Yeah. Okay. So there's a question here and, and this one really speaks to me because I think so much about the, the, the part of the film that I think really just stays with me over and over is the, is the moments with Billy Jr. Um, and, and so I'm gonna read this question from Tobias because it comes as close to what I was thinking about as it, as it can. Um, can you talk about the reparative moment with Billy Tipton Jr.? In other words, the healing that occurred when he starts to realize that his father belongs to a community who cares deeply about his life. He says, I've been asked these questions hundreds of times, but not in this way. So what is the different way he asked? Was there a specific kind of trans type of inquiring in the film that created a new space of healing for both Tipton's history and Tipton Jr.? I think that Chase being the person who was asking the questions was something that he there was so much care and thought and you know warmth going into all of these questions about his father. There wasn't any questions about um, the, the theme of like masquerading or pretending to be someone else or de deception, you know? And I think that that was something that you know, clearly changed his perception of like what we were coming to him to ask, you know, it, it changed I don't know how long, like if you, Chase, if you saw or, and Ash from your time with, with Billy Jr., if there was a, a turning point um, once he seemed to warm up or if he was always, you know, if it, or if it was just at that moment that I was present for when he, the moment where you disclosed to him, Chase. Now I'm asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, Joining us as our third co-host. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> always, always have Amos as a third co-host, if you can. Um, the, yeah, we spent, and, and Amos, you were there for, for most of it. I, at least that's what I remember, anyway. <laughs> well, we yeah, were spent- the end. Right, right, right. So we were there with, with uh, Billy Jr. for three days and definitely a relationship building. Um, and, you know, because, and so we were a small team and we were coming into his home and 
you know, his wife made us cookies and coffee and all the things that what happens when you go to, you know, a small town, uh, you get the hospitality of a, of a small town. We had all of those things. But I think he, when we walked in, there was a lot of, you know, Billy Jr. was super, was was very polite, but he was also kind of like, I've answered these questions before. And, and he was kind of giving us a lot of those, like, you know, wrote answers that he had had before. And it was really just like spending the time and, and unpacking and, and, and just spending all this time with his father's things. Like he's literally kept all of his dad's stuff to the, to his hair gel, like well, not gel, hair pomade, which is a hundred years old. Like I won't do that. I think my parents are watching right now. I will not keep your hair gel dad. Like that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, my dad doesn't use hair gel so it's, it's okay but um but you know like he really really is the keeper of his like of his father's archives and so then once it was you know really came out that the team was very interested in who his dad was then we got into the more interesting conversations you know so um, and of course, because because Chase was uh, was was the, was doing all the interviews, it was it was a real relationship that was building between these two that that we got to capture. Mm. Yeah. Well, now that you've given a shout out to your parents, I'm going to give a shout out to my parents in the webinar because <laughs> thank you for tuning in. Um, you know, I, it's interesting to think about the question as a pivot point in the film because uh, it also felt like a roadblock, which was to say at some point we came far enough in the intimacy of the exchange where I felt ethically that the only way forward for me to hold that space with Billy Jr. was to be explicit and very clear about who I was and what was motivating my approach and the vulnerability that came alongside my questions. And, and in that moment, I, I, you know, I remember clearly sort of looking at Amos and we had this like T for T, like we're going in kind of moment uh, of reckoning before I think the, really the landscape of our, the whole affective world of that house changed. And mm -hmm. I think it was in part because Billy Jr. recognized a new pathway, a new possibility and sort of softening to a multiple reading of his, of his father's history. Yeah, I have a question that's, it's not related, but it, it, there, there were, there's, there are, a couple, there are a couple of moments that I would say were the sort of emotional touchstones of the film. And, and that was one of them, you know, in the end when, you know, you said that, you know, um, you know, some people think of you, your father a, a, as a hero. And um, that, I mean, that, you know, so that was one of the emotional touchstones, I think, of the film. And the other one um, is, is comes from a question from the audience that I'll also bring up. I mean, we can really talk about that too, the intimacy really that the film was able to produce because of moments like these. Um, so this is a question from Clara Krauss. I was wondering concerning the scene between Buck and Billy and that incredibly powerful moment of recognition and seeing being seen. How did that idea come about? Obviously we can know that they interacted and met in some way in the studio, but do we know that they did have that intimate one-on-one -on -one moment of recognition in real life? Or how did you come up with the idea for that scene? And it says, love this movie so much, thank you all. And I think this is a, you know, and so this was also for me like a real emotional touchstone of the film. And Marquise, you were in one of those scenes and there was another actor as well. Um, that was in that scene. So it's also interesting to think about what it was like to act the scene in addition to the idea behind, you know, um, casting it. Was it, uh, uh, you know, were you doing um, sort of historical revision or, you know, ma imaginative history um, or did that come up in the archive? You know, so these are all very, there's a very rich question here. Total, I love the question. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I love, <laughs> the buck billy um Can you summarize that moment a little bit for the yeah so there's a scene that yeah. yeah there's a a scene in the film that was written for the actors to audition with which is between billy tipton and buck thomason and buck thomason according to diane middlebrook's book which was very well researched i will give her that um buck thomason was a radio dj uh transmasculine radio dj um, big booming voice, 
um, ha, you know, dirty mouth, um, just loud, uh, put on a fake, had a fake Southern accent all the time, um, like really put on this Oklahoma accent. And there was, there's never really like a proof that they were friends or frenemies. I mean, there's in the story, I mean, in Middle Brooks book, there are passages and quotes where they, Buck gave Billy his first shot you know, um, gave him his first opportunity on live radio to perform and promote himself. And that there's really not much more than, than that. And the fact that Buck is transmasculine. So that scene is uh, a creative, um, wishful thinking of, of uh, friends or frenemies, you know, or bromance, whatever you want to say between them. Something I like to think about all the time. All the time, <laughs> not all the time, but you know. Can you say something more about why it was important for you then to create that moment now that we know yeah. that it was about, about create, like, I mean, Cynthia Hartman calls this like intimate history. What does it mean to like project your own, um, you, you, know, you know, desires or, 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 or relationship to a particular history onto something like fact? I felt like that scene was super important to write because in Middlebrook's book, you know, she, the entire book feels like it's made up of all these moments of her trying to prove that Billy's experience in the world was um, a performance, um, that his gender, that his masculinity was for job to, to get work um, and the way that he dressed, everything about him. But then, in, then she goes on to, to mention this person, Buck Thomason and describes Buck almost exactly like Billy. Uh, so it was like Billy is this one in a trillion person, but then in the same city, he comes across Buck Thomason. And I thought that that, I mean, it's so interesting how little she put that together. She chose to ignore that, um, that relationship or the fact that Billy could have seen himself and Bucky could have seen themselves in Billy and that they could have potentially had these conversations or had these, you know, glimpses of being seen in each other. So I wanted to create that in those scenes. I wanted to dive deeper um, because it was something that was right there in Middlebrook's book, um, but wasn't, uh, she, she, she really decided not to see it or not to acknowledge how much could have been there. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting in of itself. Marquise, what was it like to be one of the actors in that scene? Um, I don't remember uh, that being my scene. Actually, I, I don't know if my, I think so. Oh, you, did. you did, you said, you're in the trailer too. <laughs> That's like, what you say? <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember, I did have, I did have those signs for some, and I just watched it. I don't remember having that specific dialogue with Buck, um, like play out in the film. But of course I, I did get the scene and I got the signs and I, pretty much thought the same thing Amos was thinking, which was how was it possible that she opted to, you know, um, intentionally be disconnected or believe that there was a disconnect between the two as if somehow Billy Tipton and his performance was, you know, as a transmasculine person, like he's just, himself, like he's a monolith. He's the only one, it's just him doing this thing. And yet somehow here's Buck, who happens to be in the way that he is described, especially in the way that Amos wrote him, um, probably far more hypermasculine than Billy was. I mean, he was really loud, he was boisterous, everything about his energy read masculine. Right? I didn't need to have eyes to see that. Like I could <laughs> feel what that was. Um, but for me, I thought it was an interesting choice and I thought it was a choice that made the most sense um, because then it, it really gives, context to his existence and that it is not simply a performance it is not just about jazz uh, because this is also someone who's you know living his life this way with his family within his work and then somehow meets someone who's almost a mirror to himself and yet there's still no need to finally reveal and be like oh you know i'm really you know what i mean like they're just themselves they literally just are, are engaging in that dialogue it's just themselves and I think even Billy is kind of, he's kind of just taken it back, which that I thought was really interesting. Um, that somehow he had this moment of like, wait, what? Oh, okay. Like we're kindred spirits here. Like, I, I, I don't know. That was just weird. That whole moment when he realizes who Buck is. And then he's mm -hmm. like, oh, wait, 
you're like me, like we're the same. I thought that was cool. Um, one of the one of the things that kind of came up that was so exciting about the auditions and the casting was when you know when we had written these different scenes of different points in his life and like Buck was Buck was someone that was like yes gravitated towards this this person and yes he gave him his first shot all of these different things but then we had kind of when we when we sent out the sides we'd kind of forgotten that maybe we are the ones that know the most about Billy's story and so when the when the actors are coming in and and doing their reads the first time and I think it was like maybe the second or third actor who came in um in LA which is where we did the auditions first and who asked like why is he so surprised by Buck <laughs> like what's what's why is he so taken aback by seeing this guy and they were like oh we act we didn't explain that and so then it was you know this these beautiful moments of recognition in the room with these actors live and then of course like with Alex with Alex Blue Davis and Amos having this like you know beautiful moment of of recognition and Alex you know remembering in real time that that Amos was that person for him that was just like you know you can't write or like anticipate those types of like beautiful documentary connections so um that was that yeah, that is a very special moment in the film and in making the film and being in the room being like fortunate enough to be in the room while that happening was a was a privilege yeah. So I have another question that isn't in the Q&A, Dana. Somebody gave me a question in advance. So I'm going to read oh, that one if that's cool. all right. <laughs> um, so uh, this was a question that a little bit of a pivot. So a question about wondering about decisions around how you shot the film uh, overall and what that process looked like. So, you know, for example, you show at the end, you're showing Billy Gillett Jr. the clips of the actors. Um, so that obviously happened before. Uh, so, or, you know, so just curious about sort of, we, we experience the narrative that you create, but wondering a little bit about the process and decisions for how to shoot the film. Ash, do you want to split this labor? Do you want to talk <laughs> New York, LA, and I'll talk Spokane? <laughs> I love it when you talk Spokane, too, <laughs> <laughs> um, Sure. Uh, yeah, well, let's, we, we can just, we can, we can, we can riff back and forth. Let's co-direct uh, this answer. How about we do that? You know, we have all these Zoom windows. Um, so this film was shot in a total of nine days, which um, is, a, is not a lot of, well, not a lot, not a lot of days. And so we did, you know, obviously lots of research and prep beforehand and really went in, you know, went into it knowing, you know, you know, roughly what we were, what we wanted to kind of achieve you know, in these different days. So we, we went to LA for a number of days. We did the casting off the bat. And so we learned a lot from that process and with, and, and having all these actors in the room and what kind of, you know, you know, things like the buck moment, like, oh, these are the sort of magical things that can happen. And to really be, you know, extra aware of that for, for New York, which we shot a couple of about, uh, about six weeks later, I, I think. And so then we did the interviews um, in both those cities as well. And, we did, we shot them in uh, various jazz clubs and nightclubs in, um, in LA and New York and in Spokane as well. And, uh, and we really wanted it to, you know, for Billy Tipton to like inhabit like the space. So let's like not do, you know, interviews in a studio, but let's like feel like if we were going to sit down with Billy, which we don't have that opportunity to, what, where, where would it be? It would be, you know, at the, you know, at a mahogany bar in a smoky room or, you know, somewhere where there's, where you're waiting for live music to happen or something like that. So we wanted to kind of build that atmosphere. So we did, we did the same process in both uh, Los Angeles and New York. And, and there was, yeah, about six weeks in between that time. And then we went to Spokane. <laughs> right, where arguably we could get the closest to Billy Tipton through the, his objects and his ephemera and his son's ongoing narration. And we were really lucky and benefited from the fact that Jameson Green lived in close enough proximity to join us in Spokane, where we were able to introduce them and produce what I call the, the proxy dad scene, where there's a kind of moment of reckoning where Billy Jr. gets to continue to understand the impact 
of his dad's legacy and Jameson so generously walks toward a conversation um, about his significance with F to M mag from the early nineties in hand. And that was really a, a luck of geography for which we're, we're very grateful. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel I have, there's a lot of there's questions in the audience but I have this question of my own that I'm gonna just, I'm gonna revert back to my question for a second because I'm dying to, to hear what you think about this. And um, I'm sort of putting my queer studies hat on um, and sort of with the risk of, of doing that thing where you sort of ask the magician to reveal their tricks. I, I really do wanna ask questions about sort of the construction of the film and really in a lot of ways, I see the film itself as kind of conjuring a theory of trans historiography, and it's certainly an intervention in the way trans histories get told. And so I just want you to talk about that because, so it unfolds under the premise that it's going to be a kind of, you know, traditional biopic or, or, or documentary of Billy Tipton's life, right? And so when I watched it the first time, you know, in particular, I had the sense that you know, I was watching a kind of making of the movie moment that was eventually gonna, just in terms of like the, the, the horizon of expectations we bring to these things, it was eventually gonna turn into um, the actual biopic. Like we were going to see, the, the script was real and um, we were gonna see uh, the, uh, who, who got the role and then we we're gonna go into, <laughs> you know, the, the film about, you know, Billy Tipton and that never happens. And then it, be, you know, it becomes slowly apparent that you're doing something entirely different, right? That you're setting us up for this intervention. Um, and that what we're actually watching is an argument about trans historiography um, or an intervention in how trans histories get produced or, or don't get produced. And um, I'm just wondering if you can talk about this. This is what, for me, why I will now always teach this film <laughs> and why I think it's such an important piece of art that you've made. Oh, thank you for that question. I love that question. I'm watching Ashley and Amos smile at me. I love that question. Um, you know, early on in my grad school training, I really attached to Halberstam's in a queer time and place where he articulates various treatments of transgenderism in film from the rewind where your trans subject is outed partway through which forces a kind of revisioning, re-looking, re-experimenting to something like ghosting where you gain access to the trans subject only through a kind of haunting audio where you understand that the trans person is no longer with us to something like doubling where the presence of more than one trans person destabilizes the narrative. And, you know, if I were going to, to really take your question seriously, I would say we're like crunching Halberstam and doing all things at once and really thinking critically about how time operates as a key pivot point in all of those variations. And so how can we be looking to the past and to the future simultaneously? And how can a looking toward a future impact, in fact, how we see a past and, all of the, the related steps in between. What about Amos and, and Ashley? Do you want to answer that as well? <laughs> no, that was a, that was that was that was a liner up and send her to Chase question. <laughs> yes, I agree with Chase's answer. <laughs> Like just in terms of in terms of then the casting. So what did you do? So like was the it was there a bigger script? Was it only the audition moments that were scripted? Um, you know, and so did you sat down, you had a conversation, okay, you know, this is how we're gonna do it. I just I kind of want to know more about the magic. Ash, I mean, do you the, have do you have so. your uh, recipe card board? Oh, it's this is a great it, you don't have to bring it, but it's a great it's I a can great go way. get it. It's not yeah. that far. But um but <laughs> But yeah, I mean, okay, I'll go get it. And Amos, you talk about yeah, writing the yeah. Cool. I mean, cool. the scenes <laughs> were part of um, you know while writing the treatment of the documentary. Ashley and I were like figuring out the you know what moments do we want to focus on in Billy's life, and if there was the, to answer your question, no, it was never a full script, a full feature <laughs> um, narrative script. Um, it was very specific and, and plotted out ahead of time that they would be like short vignettes um, of his life. And we wrote a, probably like about five of them and used less and put them in very specific, you know, parts in the written treatment, which no one sees. So it's not even like something that I can, that is part of the conversation really. It's just like part of our process of before making it, before yeah. producing. 
And so maybe one thing we can do to tether the summary of the scenes to the structure of the film that Ashling will reveal in a moment via color-coded <laughs> recipe cards is that if we think about those scenes as thematic, contextual, or temporal anchors, then how do you build your interview subjects and questions around the potential for mm. alliance, disagreement, cohesion? And Ash and I built pods, essentially, and then moved them around and thought, how do we get from a conversation <laughs> about the Butch F to M border wars in the 90s to a conversation about the history of jazz to a conversation about romance and embodiment and through a kind of literal rearranging and the, the glory that is our many interlocutors, we were able to, to build the edit from that place yeah. or from those places rather. Yeah. So in full Vanna White. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, so, so these were the different, you know, different topics and different issues that we wanted to, that we wanted to touch upon, including Brandon, Tina, and Middlebrook, and, you know, from identity, privacy, death story, uh, you know, accountability, visibility, but, and then peppered in between is that we have the casting as sort of markers as, as different places that, that will kind of bring us, kind of bring us kind of back to the present in, a, in an interesting way, but you know, still uh, in this world of fantasy as well. And also with Billy Jr. Just you know, he was sort of our thread, kind of our emotional thread going through it. These these two these two n parts that were not just um, experts and 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 academics and and act and actors and people from Hollywood. Uh, interpreting or understanding his story but but yeah I mean to go back to the the scenes like I think yeah just in terms of what Amos was saying about writing the treatment and writing out the different points that we were like well, what just sort of instinctively having done this research are the moments that like if we if we if we were a fly on the wall if we were like the what would be the places and the things we would want to see um or like you know in our wildest dreams and so those Different, mo different parts of his life really kind of sprung to the surface. And yeah, we had a few other ones that were like, you know, to do with the era or to do with different other encounters that he might have had and other, other places he might find himself. But it was, you know, it was, it was, I think it was a good process for us to just try to get into his, as the writers like to get into his, you know, skin and just go, what would I feel if I'd met Duke Ellington, me being Billy Tipton, being being able to meet my my idol for the first time? What would that feel like, you know? Um, so that was that was a fun process for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting to hear about that. Allison, do you wanna? Sure. Uh, we have two questions that sound the same, but are actually have very different answers, I suspect, but I'm going to ask them together. So the one is from Hennessy that says, has Billy Jr. responded to the film? And the other one from Zoe that says, has Middlebrook seen the film and responded? So I'll <laughs> throw them both to you and take what you like. Well, Middlebrook um, is no longer on this, she's passed away, on this, uh, you know, planetary this, reign. This little coil. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Middlebrook's daughter, who I believe was someone we were maybe in touch with earlier, or someone who, I don't know if she's seen that. Mm -hmm. Ash, do you know? Or uh, no, we don't. We don't know if, if her daughter had seen it. Um, but like years ago had been in touch, uh, the production had been in touch with her. Um, and yeah, Billy Jr. I mean, Chase, you've been in touch with, uh, with Billy the most. Yeah, I was just on the phone with Billy Jr. And he has not seen it um, <laughs> because he's waiting for the DVD that we burned him to arrive in the mail. So he, he's decided to say no to the links and is waiting for his DVD experience. And so I you know, am on the edge of my seat waiting for the call whenever that DVD arrives. Yeah. Um. Okay, I'm gonna go also back to the question board here um, from Marin Hancock. Um, two questions. What was the genesis of the idea to include a casting call for the character of Billy Tipton? It was such a cool framework for the story. 
Um, and yeah, so were you originally thinking, this, this is actually multi-part, <laughs> were you originally thinking of dramatizing parts of his story and actually auditioning someone to play him? This is similar to mine, that's why I really like it. Uh, or was the framework conceived as a way to include a multiplicity of voices and perspectives? And two, what nightclubs did you shoot the interview footage in? The locations are gorgeous. Um, B, uh, it was always supposed to be, you know, it, we'd always conceived it as, as, as how you saw it, that it would be, that it would be a kind of in process meta film that was going to involve a multitude of different people for those different ex perspectives, experiences, and for us to really acknowledge that, you know, like Amos said, like, there's no moving images of Billy Tipton. So if we we're going to contribute mm -hmm. images of Billy Tipton to the world, then we wanted to we had to be very, very thoughtful about this process. And so in that it was like, well, we don't, now we have kind of the opportunity to, to, you know, as Chase like say, like think out loud with a lot of different people about how you interpret somebody that we don't have, we don't have uh, a record of besides the music that he left and some recordings. And, um, and the nightclubs we shot, again, like in Los Angeles and in New York, for the most part and so we shot at um no name bar in in LA on Franklin uh on Franklin Avenue I might be getting that wrong might get it wrong and um and then we shot uh in the slipper room in New York and we shot at the box in New York which for queer and trans cultural production geeks are such valuable sites for queer and trans cultural production. And if you're in the know, you know, and if you're not, you get to be in the glory that is a dirty, grimy music jazz venue. And we shot in the House of Soul in Spokane. <laughs> So I have another question for you that I think you've touched on a little bit, but I've been thinking about it a little bit of a different way. One of the things that I think your film captures so interestingly is, I want to say like almost like a different ways in which people from different generations come up against uh, Billy's story. So I, I'm thinking, and I forgive me for forgetting uh, the, the younger actor's name who talks about, um, uh, talks about coming from, have only ever known cis culture. I've only ever, that, I think that's something they say in the film. I've only ever known cis culture. So when I first meet Billy's story, I'm, I sort of, and then sort of works through that in their own identity sort of thinking. And I think about that in contrast to, I think it's with, I think it's with Susan Stryker who, who just offers such a different, such a different response. And I think, I think what's really interesting about those responses and then all the responses sort of I don't want to say in between, but in the kind of galaxy of it, um, almost captures so much of like the last, I want to say even less or 40 years of, of sort of identity politics and culture around trans identities. And just wondered if you have sort of have thoughts or reactions to, I don't, it's not a question, it's more a thread. I love your summary of the approach as being a galaxy. I like to think about it as a kind of constellation of things and people or a, a kaleidoscopic approach to a history. And, you know, I think we are so lucky to have people like Susan Stryker, Jameson Green, Kate Bornstein in the film who've been thinking out loud about transness and gender nonconforming subjects and themes for decades and whom we all cite as, you know, real leaders and, and, um, quite literal trendsetters. I mean, I do choose those words carefully. And, you know, they offer a kind of reflection and a looking back to say, here are the, the ways in which identity politics inform choices that were made at this time. Let's ground these opinions in historically specific moments and then address and analyze and think together about how they change. What was at stake in holding on to this at that moment? What's at stake in letting it go? And then the invitation to think with people like Riley Snorton and Thomas Page McBee and Stephen Pennington, who are all working in and out of the academy and in journalism and the arts, who are taking in some ways a generation of trans theory and trans scholarship and contesting, adding to, revisioning, reforming, breaking away from, and to actually concurrently 
be playing in both of those spaces. And then to have an 18 year old trans masculine actor who has just come out to his mom in the weeks prior to the film say, this is the most incredible thing in the world and I've never really encountered any bad feelings. My mom has been in, I'm looking at Marquis Nod because there was this amazing exchange in a waiting room where we were listening to this incredible person be filled with such joy and feel so unencumbered by uh, 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 an announcement of self and to reflect on how all of those things are happening simultaneously in the rooms of our film and also in our communities more broadly. Yeah, I, I actually found that to be a really interesting part of the film. You get to see living legends sharing space with folks who are just coming into themselves, you know, in the last year or two, um, which is kind of wild to really think about, especially in the way of like our own history. I think for many of us, we're like living history. Trans people don't really have a lot of histories to like the fact that all of this is existing in one space at one time. Um, across the generations, if you will, is just, it's so phenomenal. And it's so beautiful to watch play out and see. Um, in the beginning of the film, there is a person whose voice, I don't know who it is because it's a voiceover happening just at the top of the film. And they're talking about how they listened to Billy Tipton on the way to their audition. And they were just like, oh my God, I can't believe I've never heard this before. I didn't even know who Billy Tipton was. And you know, it, it's interesting, I'm 39, so I'm gonna be 40, but it's really not that so far removed that idea of like not knowing who Billy Tipton is for people who are even my age. There are people that are from my generation in time, they have absolutely no idea who Billy Tipton is or maybe Little Axe, right? Um, but I think it's a large part of that issue has been because of the way in which trans history exists. And it's always kind of been through the gaze of cisness. Um, so there's not a really lot of like honest stuff that lives contextually just for us. But I just thought it was cool though, to see this all happening and playing out in the same film with someone who's 18 years old and then also gets to be a part of a film and sharing space with Susan Stryker, Jameson Green, Kate Bernstein. Like this is, you know, bananas, if you will. <laughs> and, and history all at the same time, happening literally all at the same time. Yeah, that's beautiful. Here's a question from Gabby Moser. Gabby Moser. <laughs> hey, Gabby. This is less a question than amusing. There is a moment in the film where one of the speakers, forgive me, I can't remember who at this moment, mentions their hope that the conversation about trans masculinities can turn to address the paranoia of cisgender identity and its violence. I wonder if the moments of repair or intimacy that occur in the film are perhaps moments when the instability of identity is allowed to breathe and be recognized by others. I'm thinking here of Jacqueline Rose's essay on trans memoirs, in which she asks of the implicitly cisgendered reader, who do you think you are? This feels like a radical kind of vulnerability gifted to us as viewers by the filmmakers and actors. Do you wanna to respond to that? Yeah. I love that comment. The person who you are bringing into the conversation is Thomas Page McBee. And one of the things that he says in that narration is, I'm really invested in shining the spotlight out and having it less be about us and more about you, which is to say everybody has a gender and let's pay attention to the workings of gender and how that forms your understandings and expectations of trans or non-binary identities. And I love the the imagination that the instability of these categorizations and the instability of history and the fact that we don't actually know anything about how Billy Tipton identified, nor does it particularly matter that what are these moments of spaciousness allowing for us in the contemporary moment and allowing for us to imagine a different kind of, of embodied narration, one that can be frankly untethered from the legacy of trans autobiography, which has produced the trans subject in very particular ways for, as you have said, you know, very particular readerships or very particular publics. Yeah. It was just smiling. You're, you're letting Chase field all the theory questions, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not exactly a theory-based uh, <laughs> artist. 
<laughs> um, so I appreciate Chase's words. I actually learn a lot every time he opens his mouth. <laughs> But Amos, you know, one of the, the critical things that I love about this question and about the ways in which you work in the world is through making images, through the production of photography and through an approach to community, you contribute to the way in which we can even go off theoretically in these ways or think about structures of trans representation. Like your work is so critical to the ability to even have these conversations. Thank you. <laughs> Can you talk to us about the music and the, the I mean, obviously you, you get lucky with your subject in the sense that you have a rich repertoire of, of music to draw from in terms of Billy's uh, recordings, but can you talk to us about the decisions you made around scoring and the background music and um, I, you know, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with, with Billy's uh, catalog to know if there's particular meaning between certain kind of moments and the scoring. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about your choices there. Sure. Um, yeah, so so we, so there's two musicians, um, well, three musicians, I should say, that uh, that contributed to the film. And obviously Billy Tipton is one of them. Um, he has two albums that he recorded and he, and we had um, access to some rehearsal recordings that he did in the forties that were never made for public consumption. So, you know, and live recordings that he did that would have been on the radio that someone literally taped with a tape recorder in front of a live radio while he was uh, down at a, at a club, not too far at the ranch in. And um, so Billy's music is obviously there. It's really, it's part of, you know, how he inhabits the movie is in this way. And then Rich O'Coin, um, who is a musician based in Nova Scotia in Halifax, he, he was essentially our, our, our emotional core of the, of the sound of the film. And so a lot of the reasons that Rich was such a great person to work with is one, he's, he's a contemporary musician. He's also a live performer. And, you know, we, we finished this movie in the pandemic. And so one of the things was, you know, we had the opportunity was there's a lot of live performers that that are now sitting at home um, and not being able to have that space on the stage that that's where Billy kind of lived his life so and Rich is also a you know trained pianist he is a music producer and he also is like very cinematic in the ways that he makes music so we collaborated with him and you know really worked with him whilst cutting the film so that we were able to kind of find those moments and that that tonality to kind of, you know, you know, add that sort of emotional layer to it. And then we did all sorts of fun things with like, with the mix on like wanting to hear Billy's music or music that sounded like Billy's music or, you know, in kind of a memory kind of way. So we would mix it so it sounded like it was playing in a room nearby because there's that kind of comfort of hearing someone play a piano, you know, two doors down, you know, to kind of feel that kind of space. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's for, you know, for, for the film and for, for the way that we like to work on this was, was really to kind of integrate all of that while we were, while we were still finding the words of the movie and sort of the structure of the film to come through. So that was a lot of, that was a lot of fun. And then our credit music um, is uh, this, you know, beautiful collaboration between Patrick Watson and Lane Weber, who's a transmasculine you know, musician based in Toronto. And that was a really, really like beautiful number that we were able to, to have contributed to the movie. So, so yeah, I mean, it was an important, was an important aspect was to, to get the soundscape and the music and to really like feel Billy in that other way um, in the film. Yeah. Um, I have another question from the audience here. I'm just thinking about music because music kind of almost took on, was like a character in the film also um, in really important ways. So that was a beautiful explanation. Um, here's a question from the audience. Uh, question for everyone. What was the first time you saw a trans person represented in media in a way that actually felt accurate to your own experiences? Which, that, that's, it's interesting. Well, and Dana, I have to interrupt to say that somebody else on the question says, as a trans man, I've never before felt myself seen represented on screen. So thank you. So know that you're playing a role in that as well. Yeah, right. I know because, or, or have you, right. Yeah, exactly.
I'm actually like racking my brain trying to find figure out the first moment um, in like television film, and I can't. I mean, I go the go to is like you know Brandon Tina and Boys Don't Cry, but I don't know if that felt authentic to me at the time. More like terrifying. Um, but there was something there uh, that I saw in that character, despite not having a trans person play that role, um, the way that the story was told. Beyond that, you know, the, the talk show circuit was, like so many of us, the first time seeing a trans person, period, uh, for me. That's like what pops out. But I'm still racking my brain for like, that first super authentic, relatable uh, characterization that's like been fictionalized. Someone can, if someone has, an, has a better answer than that, <laughs> more concrete. Uh, I mean, of course, my, my automatic go-to is always gonna be Reno. Um, on Jari, but I think it's only because I'm, I had an opportunity to see a Black trans mass person, and, and then also he was someone that I knew from the ballroom community. Um, in the way of fictional storytelling, yeah, I feel you, Amos. I, I'm still waiting. Yeah. I think so. I, I think I'm still waiting. I, but I, I think, hmm. I don't know. There's a part of me that feels like in the way of storytelling, in order for us to really see like authentic images of ourselves, I, I think it's really about us having, you know, a seat at the table, being able to create the story, um, direct production, you know, writer's table, the whole thing. So I think it's a work in progress, but I, I feel like it's getting that much closer than it was obviously 20 years ago. So I'm hopeful. Um, my answer is that I was an undergraduate student studying theater at UCLA, and uh, I wasn't a particularly syllabus stalking student at that time and did not know that there was a guest speaker that was going to be attending my, I think it was called queer performance class. And totally unbeknownst to me, Kate Bornstein walked into the front of the classroom and began a performance. And as part of the performance, she dropped the register of her voice and then said, did that do anything to help you figure me out? And I was sitting halfway back in the room and I thought to myself, yes, like, yes. And what she was doing was trying to draw attention to all of the transphobic expectations that we have of trans people to help us others make sense of trans identities. But in that moment, I thought like, this is the power that performance and publicness can have in, in transforming our socio-political contexts. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess, Marquis, I mean, in the work that you're doing, you're sort of contributing to this, you know, outside of this particular project. Uh, you know, I, I, Law and Order Junkie, definitely saw you on, on, that, on that episode of Law and Order SVU. I thought you did a phenomenal job. I don't know how you, you don't have to talk about it here, but, you know, you're, you're, pretty, you're welcome to. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the, you, like the part of the, being part of the cultural production and the work and life that you have is also pretty powerful. Thank you for saying that. Um, yes, obviously I got to play an authentic trans character, but I would say that there were some things that I would believe to be flawed. No slight at all to Law and Order, SVU, obviously, <laughs> but in thinking about a trans masculine character that somehow because he has a trans past or he, and more specifically, and let me be cognizant of saying this, more specifically because he was assigned female at birth, he couldn't have possibly um, have been the person who sexually assaulted said said um, survivor, and so that for me, yeah, there's <laughs> there's quite a few layers I think in the way of like authenticity and storytelling and just the way that we think about trans bodies in general that could stand some evolving. I think that we're we're getting there. It's getting just a little bit closer, but there's a, I think there's always even with something that is great that we think is like for me personally, I think is like you know, the best film or the best show or like whatever that thing is, 
in hindsight, I can always look back at, at something and go, hmm, actually this could have been added on. Maybe that could have, you know, could have been taken out. I think it's our job to be constantly critical of the work that we're doing and thinking about the ways that we can constantly change that narrative, not just being comfortable with like the bare minimum. Oh, we got a, an authentic trans guy to play the role. So it must be perfect. So this must be the episode. No, that's, that's not always true. It's not always gonna be true. Um, yes, we use a complicated, weird show for sure. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate your response on I that. I mean, Mirska Har 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 Mirska Har Hargitay. Am I pronouncing her name correctly? I mean, it's, it's like I'm glad she exists. <laughs> I'm just saying, but but also problematic. Um, uh, so I just want to follow up on this question, actually. And Marquise, you were saying, you know, I agree with you, Amos. You know, I'm still looking, right? And so it really is the, the question of, of representation and, um, and um, uh, that, that, that's, you know, coming to the foreground here. And I think it was Pennington, um, uh, is it, uh, who, what, what is their, uh, what is their name? Stephen? Uh, yes, uh, yes, right, Stephen Pennington, who also brought this up and Chase, you had mentioned, um, uh, the sort of Bochetian border words, just sort of, you know, fleetingly for a, for a second earlier um, in the evening. And one of the things um, that um, Pennington talks about is also, um, you know, in a very delicately, but when, you know, Billy Tipton, the story first broke, it did break in the, in, in the tabloids. It did break in tabloid television, right? And actually speaking of, you know, Brandon Tina, I, heard, I learned about him on the Montel Williams show. Like, you know, again, aging myself. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but, but in response to that, you know, one of the things that he says um, is that, you know, uh, sort of recalling the history, like during the time, there was this sense that a lesbian couple had been discovered. And part of wanting Kitty to admit um, that she knew was to, to admit to her own lesbianism or something, right? Um, both in homophobic ways, but also really interestingly, and this is what Pennington gestures toward, um, there, were, there were people, and I, I, I will sort of say guilty as charged, I was one of them. I was in college at the time when the story, when the story broke in the tabloids. And it was very much like we thought, oh, we found a Butch Dyke, you know, there's, a, you know, there, you know, and, and it was like this beautiful, wonderful thing, you know, that we could then project our own desires onto and imagine. Um, and it's very interesting in the thing that the film draws our attention to and that Pennington does as well, the way that, you know, that kind of, um, you know, even queer desire colluded in the erasure of trans history at that moment. Um, and so I'm just, I'm wondering about that. You, you included in the film, I'm wondering if you had conversations about that and, um, and the focus on that in the film. So one of, the, one of the ways to answer that is to tell you that there's an entire section of our interviews that include a, a really sustained engagement with Donna Minkowitz, who's the Dyke identified journalist responsible for breaking the Brandon Tina murder in the Village Voice in the early 1990s and who penned an apology 20 plus years later, looking back and saying, here's what I didn't know when I wrote that thing. And one of the things that Minkowitz does is claims Brandon Tina as a lesbian who's playing out masculinity as a result of childhood sexual trauma. And one of the things that Minkowitz does so beautifully in our conversation is says, I didn't know, and I found myself identifying with, and I authored as a journalist from that place of identification and possibility. And yes, 20 plus years later, I can see all of the things that I didn't know, but I didn't know then. And I came out of a community that was, as you said, Dana, trying to find queer alliance, queer romance, queer representation, queer possibility. And so for us, we had thought, we weren't sure how much space Brandon Tina's life murder and the representation thereof would take up in our film and ultimately made choices to move otherwise. But Minkowitz in some ways becomes a stand in for Middlebrook in our conversations. Uh, uh, what would we know if we were able to think about authorship with authors? And you know, one of the things that I think is funny and Ash and I often joke about in the edit is I was obsessed with asking questions about the Butch F to M wars and none of our people, none, even people who were 
thinking and writing about it at its time were that interested in talking about it. They're like, ah, you know, and so you've got, to follow the, <laughs> you've got to follow the flow of your documentary subjects. And so I had all these fantasies that that was going to be the recipe card that would turn the corner of our film. And, and it just wasn't it. And, you know, we as a team have decided that we're going to move. There it is. <laughs> we're going to move the Minkowitz conversation and a really beautiful conversation between Amos and Donna in particular into a, a short form film that will uh, come out alongside the book, uh, a book being published about the film as well. So. Okay. Oh, so work. you're using the footage. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that'll be interesting. So we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, uh, Alison, I do want to give you a chance to, if, if you have, did you have, were, were all your questions answered? Are you good? Okay. So I just thought maybe as a, as a moment of closure or parting, um, if each of you can just speak once again, you know, very briefly, um, really, but anything that you want us to, to know about this film, like what, what, what are you hoping? You know, because we're audience members, we watched it, right? And, and me with great pleasure. Um, I'm just wondering, yeah, as, as a kind of closing comment, what were, what, what were you hoping to do with this film? What are you hoping um, that the, like the audience feels about it or, or what our takeaway about it might be? I really hope that people are able to see this as like a, a conversation in progress um, that about you know, how to tell a story of a trans person, um, the right versus the wrong way, really like it's an ongoing conversation and it's something that is, should not be the end all, be all, you know, wait, there is no answer of like, who was Billy Tipton? How does he want to be remembered? How do we tell his story? It's really like, it's ongoing despite the, the, the film being complete. Mm -hmm. Ashling, yeah. Yeah, you know, same that it's uh, that hopefully this movie is like an opening of a door to, you know, further curiosities of learning more about Billy um, or about any of the people that are in the film if you hadn't encountered them before. And I mean, I mean, I hope the audience takes what they take from it. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's it's a movie that that sparks discussion we've discovered in a really wonderful way. So I hope that people are able to watch it with others to be able to like have those conversations. And if it opens up, you know, um, if it opens up more, more discussions, then that's, 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 you know, then that's the goal. Marquise or Chase? Marquise? <laughs> Um, I hope that audiences look at this film and feel motivated and inspired to explore transmasculine history beyond Billy, Billy Tipton. Um, I think for me personally as a, as a transmasculine artist and, and creative in this industry, it is very frustrating to hear people say or have the assumptions that somehow trans men are just not interesting or they're not entertaining. I, I've actually heard that kind of thrown around. So I hope that when people see this film, they're not necessarily entertained or anything like that more than they are inspired to want to know more and take the time out to really empathize with Billy's story as, as with all of our stories. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy for Marquise to have the final word. Okay, all right, good. Thank you. So let me thank Allison Burgess for joining me as a co-host in this event and for the SGDO and co-sponsoring the event with the Bonham Center. And let me thank all four of you both for being here with us today and st you know, sticking with us and answering all these questions. But I think perhaps most of all for, for making this film, for acting in this film, for writing this film. Um, so, uh, so I look forward to the next projects um, that come of this and other endeavors in your lives. Thank you very, very much. I'm just gonna... Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs>